hate that I live in a world where I have to call my parents and warn them that an internet troll might send them a picture of Okay, me. let's talk about this photo, allegedly of Madeline Soto, that has gotten a sheriff in trouble, Sheriff Marco Lopez, that he reportedly shared online, either accidentally or he's claiming, I guess, his story's changed. He's in trouble with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. He is being investigated, according to WFTV, and Maddie's father weighed in on that photo. Department of Law Enforcement is now investigating after a local sheriff shared a photo of what appeared to be Madeline Soto's body on social media. Coming up, Nine investigates whether charges will be filed. Thankfully, he hasn't seen it. I haven't seen it. I think a lot of people haven't seen it. But Sheriff Lopez's story has changed. He talks about it being, oh, just an area of interest. It wasn't really Maddie, but it turns out I believe it is Maddie, and that's why he might have charges brought upon him. I don't know. Plus, we're going to talk about the new information I got today regarding Stefan Stearns. Who has he been talking to? Who has come to visit him? Who hasn't come to visit him? Sometimes the most interesting information is who hasn't seen him. What are these five phone calls? Let's talk about it all. And the timing of these phone calls. I'm matching them up with certain things that have occurred in the case. And I'm wondering what's happening. Are these phone calls related to some of the stuff we see coming in the docket? Let's talk about all of it. First, the crime scene photo. A crime scene photo was leaked online on Instagram, the Instagram account of Osceola County Sheriff Marco Lopez. And according to the news, you know, people who have seen it, I never saw it, thankfully, it appeared to show the body of Madeline Soto. It looks like indeed Sheriff Lopez shared it on accident, but according to WFTV Channel 9 out of Orlando, FDLE is investigating the sheriff. So that news station is saying that Lopez claimed it wasn't Maddie in the photo and it wasn't even the crime scene location or it was an area of interest. But reporter Shannon Butler, she's been on it. She is saying that's not true because the person displayed in the photo was wearing the clothes that Maddie was allegedly last reported to be wearing. So again, I haven't seen the photo. Thankfully, most of the public hasn't seen the photo, so I can't confirm match up with whatever Jennifer Soto and Stefan Stearns claimed Maddie was wearing. You know, we can't prove that because we haven't seen the photo. I'm sure one day a jury will see the photos, unfortunately. Thankfully, Maddie's dad, Tyler Wallace, has not seen the photos either, but it was interesting that I did just catch a snippet on the six o'clock news where Tyler told the station that he hates the fact that he had to call his own parents and warn them, look out, some internet troll might be sending you guys a photo, he said, of his dead daughter. He just hates that's the world we live in. I can understand that. I can imagine uh, calling your parents and saying, you might see a photo of, you know, your granddaughter, Maddie. Some random troll might send you this thinking it's funny. Thankfully, I don't think that's happened, but it's sad that Tyler did have to prepare his parents for that reality, that notion. I mean, I'm sure they expect if they decide to go to the trial, of course, you know, some victims' families can handle it, some can't, some don't want to see any crime scene photos and they have to walk out during that portion of the trial if they go at all. You know, that's up to them. That's their decision. But it's sad. On new at six, an FDLE investigation is now underway over a photo shared to a local sheriff's social media account. Nine investigates what's next after the sheriff claimed the picture wasn't of a missing 13-year-old's body in a wooded area. Osceola County Sheriff Marcos Lopez shared that picture of what appeared to be Madeline Soto's body on his personal Instagram account. Good evening, I'm Darlene Jones. I'm Martha Sagowski. We told you the picture was sent out the morning after her body was found. It was taken down a short time later. Channel 9 investigative reporter Shannon Butler has been following this case closely. She's joining us live right now tonight. And Shannon, you found out FTLE is now investigating what happened with the picture. Yeah, we don't know how long it will be before FTLE finish that as investigation or what, if any, charges could come from what appears to be a mistake. But we do know people have been interviewed, including the people who found Madeline's body. The sheriff's office told Channel 9 it was an accidental post on Instagram, but then told our partners at WDBO that it was not the body of Madeline Soto in that picture, just an area of interest where the body was found, calling the claims that it was Madeline a political stunt. 
but the sheriff did not say whose body was shown then in his picture. And we know from the investigation his claims are not actually true. In fact, the body was wearing clothes that matched the clothes Madeline was said to be wearing when she was reported missing. Her father told me he did not see that picture, but he did have something to say about what happened. I hate that I live in a world where I have to call my parents and warn them that an internet troll might send them a picture of my dead daughter and that they should just go ahead and start preparing for that possibility. I hate that we live in that world. I, that's where I land on that. There were also some questions about why the executive director at the sheriff's office took a selfie with Stephen Stearns after his arrest. We have asked FDLE for comment today, but we have not yet heard back. In the meantime, the state and the police departments are continuing to meet on the entire investigation to see if and when more charges could be filed. But for now, they have no new updates. They tell us check back again, maybe next week. Martha. Even though Tyler mentioned having to call his parents and warn them, I still haven't seen Maddie's grandmother on her paternal side, you know, that is Tyler's mom. I haven't seen her portion of the interview yet. I think each day they might be repeating the same segment, like for 6 p.m. or 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., or whenever they still come on. Hopefully I'm catching most of their segments. As always, I'm leaving the links to WFTV in the first comment below, down in the description, so you guys can go watch the whole thing yourself and go find all the videos they've published about Madeline Soto's case. So we didn't hear from her grandmother yet on Tyler's side. We haven't seen her portion, her interview. We know she's been interviewed by the station and we have not yet seen more of the stepmom's interview. But yesterday we did take a look at Tatiana, that's the stepmom's name, her really moving words at the vigil and the prayer said at Maddie's vigil and the interview Tatiana gave Shannon Butler, just leaning in closely and saying how she just wishes they would have taken Maddie, how she just wishes if she would have known anything, they would have kept Maddie. Tatiana would have taken Maddie away from all of that. So now we'll see if any charges happen against Sheriff Lopez. Now there's a former Osceola County Sheriff, Russ Gibson. He said the photo did indeed show Maddie's body and a close-up view of the crime scene. That's according to CBS affiliate WKMJ in Orlando. So we know Maddie was reported missing that Monday, February 26th, and after an exhaustive search all that week, she was found Friday, March 1st, 2024. In the meantime, that Wednesday, the Wednesday prior, Stefan Stearns, her quote-unquote stepdad, who's not really any kind of dad at all, he's the boyfriend of Maddie's mom, Jennifer Soto. He was arrested that Wednesday. But anyway, when Maddie was found that Friday, Sheriff Lopez's Instagram account published a series of photos that very next day, that Saturday, March 2nd. According to those who saw it, the crime scene photo was visible as the third photo. So I guess if you swipe over the third photo you would have seen would have been unfortunately Maddie not alive. This claims it was a close-up view of the crime scene, but the caption didn't fit so the caption of the post does lend itself to think, yeah, this probably was a mistake. Because the caption said, great day with our seniors. Hashtag Florida, hashtag senior, and they added Sheriff Marco Lopez. Sheriff Marcos Lopez, like he added himself and there was a halo smiling face emoji. So I don't know what the other photos were. Were they of seniors? Was he at some type of event that Saturday? And you know how you select photos you want to post and did he accidentally just select an additional photo that he shouldn't have now i don't know if the crime is in posting it if it was an accidental post is that part of the crime because he's a sworn officer of the law and there's other issues with the woman who took the selfie with sterns behind her which in my mind isn't as bad as like taking a photo of a victim if you're not necessarily working the case. Apparently, as I understand it, Sheriff Lopez was just assisting in the search. It's one thing if you're working the case and you're taking, of course, crime scene photos. We've seen a lot of cops do that with their phones and that makes it into evidence. It's very helpful, but it's not for posting on social media. So what happens if, yeah, you accidentally posted on social media? 
Well, there was some Osceola County spokesperson who wasn't named, but they said the post wasn't intended to be included in that, you know, array of photos. And they later issued an apology. They wrote earlier today, a post was made on social media about a community event for seniors. In the post, an investigative photo was accidentally included. The photo was immediately removed. Thank God it was removed fast enough for that photo not to be spread everywhere and gone viral. But we'll see what happens there. If any charges are brought against Lopez, maybe it truly was an error. It sounds like an error. I don't know what his role was, if he was supposed to be taking any photos at all, and if that's the problem. But of course, adding insult to literal injury by posting that on social media. So we'll see where that goes. That's the only snippet I caught at 6 p.m. of Tyler Wallace speaking about his daughter Maddie about that one event. I'm sure the station has a lot more of those interviews to be played. Maybe they'll just keep playing them every day in different news snippets. I understand the news program, they can't spend the entire half an hour like we would want or the entire hour speaking of Maddie's case. But it is interesting to see who Stefan Stearns is speaking with in jail and who he's not speaking to. So, so far I've learned as of today, today is Tuesday, April 16th. There have been no visits from Jennifer Soto and no calls from her. So they are not chit chatting it up on the phone. Basically, there's only one person I've confirmed that Stearns is speaking with and that's his dad. And I still won't say his dad's name again. I don't want any hate directed at Stearns' parents or anyone else not involved in this case. And the way it's coinciding with events in the court dockets, it's very interesting. It's making me think of when Chris Watts confessed to his own dad. We know Chris Watts was, you know, close with his father. I don't know how close Stefan Stearns is with his dad. When we went through that deep dive, and again, I'll link to it below, you could see there was a lot of time where Stefan Stern spent with his mom alone as they went through that divorce drama and then no divorce and then custody issues and a lot of time with his mom. Maybe that made him pine away for his dad more. Maybe he gets along really well with his dad. But here is the timeline. On March 1st, Stearns enrolled in the Osceola County Jail inmate calling solutions system. So his first call was that day, it was to his dad. Now we remember we saw him transported that day and this was before Maddie was discovered. So the first call on March 1st was to his dad. However, I don't know if he spoke to him at all because the talk seconds are listed as zero. This was at 10.35 a.m. before Madeline was found. Now, on March 3rd at 5.15 p.m., Stearns apparently texted some San Antonio-based number. I don't know if that was just some type of test set up for like the text messaging or the, the tablet messaging, however they can message each other. It just looks like maybe it was just a test run. Not necessarily that he was trying to contact someone in San Antonio. I don't see a person associated with that number. And of course, I'm gonna redact the numbers too. Now, Stearns did get a visit. The first time Stefan Stearns' dad visited him was on March 5th, 2024 at 12.30 p.m. Now, I don't know how long that visit lasted, but that was four days after Maddie was found. And I'm wondering when his dad saw him person to person, too bad we can't get the videos and the actual phone call audio, I wish, but Florida is like, no, unless you have a subpoena, no. We'll give you the call history, we'll give you the data surrounding what happened, but we won't give you the actual video and the phone calls unless you have a subpoena. So I don't know how long that video lasted, but that was four days again after Maddie was recovered. But I'm wondering, did Stearns' dad act like the Watts family did when they finally saw Chris Watts in Weld County on video? You know, all three of them, his mom, his dad, his sister, they just kept saying, oh, you look so good, look at you. Well, look at you. Oh, okay. Hey, well, look at you. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. Okay. You look good. Oh, thanks. You do too. I like your jacket. Uh, you like that jacket? Yeah. I thought you might. Re I thought you might re recognize that thing. It's yeah, a good, good. good weather. This is a good weather to be wearing it in up here for sure. Oh yeah, it's. I know it's got to be pretty cold out there. Yeah, it is. It ain't too bad right now. It's just a little breezy, and I'm probably. Mm, high 40s, whatever. Anyway, we're just here to tell you how much we love you. And we'll always be here for you, no matter what, son. Oh, thank you. And just, just remember that. I love and, you guys, uh, too. That, that, that. Hi.
Hey. You look good. You too. Do you know how much you're loved? Do you have any idea? I love you too. Chris, we love you so much. And we will never, ever, ever abandon you. Do you hear me? Thank you. Hey. Hey. You look good. You look good, too. I like your hair. Well, thanks. Let me see that gray. It's still there. <laughs> Oh, we miss you. I miss you too. We really do. And we love you so much. Love you guys too. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to hear everybody's voice for sure. Oh, it's, it's good to hear your voice. Did you get to watch the Panthers game? This last Sunday? Um, no, it was, uh, it was blacked out here, so it was just, was the, it? yeah, it's like, the. it just kind of depends on, like, regional, regional coverage and stuff here. Yeah. So it just kind of depends. Well, there's a, I didn't think the Panthers could pass, and they, they did a lot of passing plays. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually kind of surprised. Yeah, there's, they've been, they've been surprising me, that's for sure. Dalton wants a McCaffrey jersey now. <laughs> I bet he does. He's actually yeah, he's, uh, that's the one of the reasons I, I hear about him so much is because uh, McCaffrey actually went to high school here. Oh really? Yeah. Oh wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, he because uh, like uh, McCa uh, Ed McCaffrey he used to play for the Broncos like back when Elway was the quarterback, and he had like three sons, and they're all like like McCa Christian McCaffrey. He played high school football here. He went to Stanford and then night plays for the Panthers. There's uh -huh. a, another, I think his name's like Dylan McCaffrey. He got, um, he plays for Michigan, the yeah. college football team. He hasn't like played for him yet, but he's just like kind of waiting in the wings till his time comes up. And there's another McCaffrey son that's like, he plays high school football here. And it's just like, they're all like, it's crazy. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, they don't have to try. It's just like, it's just natural, so. <laughs> <laughs> that Christian well, yeah, McCaffrey guy, he's, he's a special player, that's for sure. He had an awesome play on Sunday because he jumped over one of the, I don't know what they're all called, you know. I just, one of the Defenders. ones I was going to, yeah. yeah, there you go, that's it. And, I mean, like, hurdled him, jumped over him, and took off. He's a he's a little beast. <laughs> yeah, he's, he, he didn't do a whole lot his first. He did a good amount his first year, but I think they realized what they could use him with his second year. And it's just kind of been like he's been like taking he's been taking the reins pretty good there. Kind of taking the pressure off Cam Newton for sure. Yeah. I think Cam likes that. He's like, I don't have to do everything. <laughs> Olsen had a few good catches too. He's coming back. Yeah, that's good. Or, that's, you know, from last season, I guess it was, when he was out. I like it when they yeah, wear those but... the black with the blue. It's cool. Mm-hmm. I always, yeah, always like the blue, like when it's like solid black or like solid black or like solid blue. I think the uh, Thursday is going to be that color rush game, so they'll probably uh -huh. be like all blue and the students will be like all black. You can be able to watch it. If, well, it's Thursday night. As long as yeah, as long as they turn the TV on, I'll be I'll be <laughs> watching that. I'll be watching that game for sure. <laughs> cool. That's good. Yeah. No. Oh. We how was you. how was the birthday and they barely talked about the elephant in the room why he was in jail they of course they're not going to say it they know not to talk about the case they were told not to talk about the case i'm sure ad nauseum but it was just a bunch of oh you look good and there's all this other stuff going around so it's kind of like a bunch of fluff and some of it was hard to hear and we know at some point cindy watts had told her son about Shanann, we know how she was, 
that did not win Cindy Watts any favors. What did Stefan Stearns and his dad talk about in that, that only singular video visit? So today, Tuesday, April 16th, I just received updated information about Stearns' more recent activities. Good afternoon, she wrote to me. I am attaching a log of the calls made by Stearns since your last request. He has had no new visitation appointments, so no one's coming in there, even though his dad saw him previously. He has had no one coming to that jail to just, you know, look at him face to face or sit there in the room or however it is on the little video to see each other. Please let me know, she wrote, if I can be of any additional assistance. She's very nice. So we've got here, March 1st, Stearns tried to call his dad, 10.35 a.m., zero seconds listed. April 10th, at 1.02 p.m., Stearns called his dad, but they spoke for zero seconds. April 10th, interestingly, is the same day there's a notice of intent to rely on certified records in Stearns' docket. So that means they could be subpoenaing different uh, social media sites, getting more info on Stearns, getting more ammunition against him. Now that same day, April 10th, a little bit later, eight minutes later at 1.10 p.m., Stearns called his dad and this time they actually spoke. They spoke for 903 seconds, which is equal to 15 minutes and three seconds which is pretty standard on these jail calls about 15 minutes long. So they talk that day. Once again, that same day at 2.53 p.m., Stearns called his dad again. And once again, they spoke for 903 seconds. Again, equal to 15 minutes and three seconds. What are they talking about? This is April 10th. So, so far he's got four calls in to his dad. Now the next day, April 11th, this will be the fifth and final call thus far. April 11th, Stearns called his dad, but they only spoke for 578 seconds, which is equal to only 9 minutes and 38 seconds. Those are the five phone calls Stearns has made. Interestingly, he's calling no one but his dad. Doesn't look like he's calling his mom, unless, of course, he's speaking with his dad and mom. You know, if he just calls his dad's phone and they're on speaker, they're like, hey, your mom's here if he's speaking with more than one person that way. But it could seriously just be his dad. And why was it shortened? Why was it shortened? Why wasn't it the long 15 minute to the max, you know, you have one minute left, global tell link, you know, we can hear that from all these calls we listen to. Why wasn't it that long? Did someone hang up on someone? Did someone have to do something? But interestingly, April 11th is the same day, April 11th, 2024, that the words amended information, they were added to his court docket. Now that could be anything. You know, part of me is like, could it be a confession? Could it be a new murder charge coming? It's doubtful that it's a confession because Stearns already entered a not guilty plea. Stearns doesn't seem like Chris Watts. You know, Chris Watts confessed, and of course he lied a lot, but I think he really listened to his lawyers and he kept talking though. He talked a lot. He brought his dad in that room. He confessed at least to what he did to Shanann, to his dad. You know, he told a lie, of course, but at least he got it out that same day, August 15th, 2018, where he was being interrogated. Now Stearns, he's lawyered up. He's not talking to anyone. He's entered his not guilty plea. So I'm thinking what happened on August 11th when he was you know, talking to his dad, that fifth phone call, it didn't last the whole 15 minutes. What happened? And then all of a sudden, amended information shows up on his court docket that same day. Did investigators hear something on those phone calls that changed the trajectory of the case? Now, most people are smart, and some people are smart enough to know by now that investigators are listening to everything. The prosecutors want to know every single second of those phone calls. And especially since Stearns isn't talking much, they're going to want to know what the heck is he talking to his dad about? So did he say something that gave them clues and hints? I think sometimes people, they forget, as we can see from some of these cases coming out, where people forget that prosecutors can pull all that audio and prosecutors can hear everything they're blabbing about and just how bad it might make some people sound. Oh, uh, like the woman in the Alec Baldwin case, I saw snippets of her 
you know, her phone calls, she's calling the jury idiots, you know, people, I think they get comfortable and they forget, oh my goodness, this could be used against me in a court of law one day. So I don't know, that's what we have now. I find it fascinating that Stearns seems to be relying on his dad quite a bit, but there's only been five phone calls so far. The last one was April 11th, the same day that amended information showed up, and that's been five days ago. So is it going to be something where they just won't talk that often? And we know those calls can be costly. I mean, it costs money to talk to them. Will he have any more in-person visitors? When we went in that deep dive on his parents, we know they were, you know, not doing well. They're getting up in age. They have their own health issues. What's going to happen? And it's so fascinating that Stearns and Jennifer Soto are not speaking. He's not apparently you know his name seems to be mud no one else is calling him now i don't know who's written him letters i did see that entry about mail returned but we just don't have details they don't give us details you just see if it's anything we can get it'll be green in the courts.osceolaclerk.com website but the latest stuff has just been all red it just says request it requested and we can't see the details but one day we will see more details, of course, and we hope it'll come with Maddie getting her justice. So that's what we have for now. Part of me kept wondering, oh boy, will I see Jennifer Soto's number showing up on Stearns' call log? You know, will they be talking as long as they can? Apparently, no, which makes sense. Whether they colluded together or not, it makes sense. If she didn't know anything, and she was totally blindsided by what Stefan did. Yeah, her instinct might be to get on the phone and scream at him, but it wouldn't be a good look to see her number showing up in the call log. She's already hated enough. And now we don't see any of his friends. We don't see anyone. I don't believe he has any siblings. So we only see Stefan and his dad apparently speaking and possibly his mom. So stay tuned. I don't know if we'll see anything different coming up on the news later tonight after I get this video up. I'll keep checking where I can to get as much of the interviews surrounding this case as possible, along with following other cases like I've been doing. Let's read Daniel 437. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and faithful, and his ways are just, and he is able to humiliate and humble those who walk in self-centered, self-righteous pride. I didn't realize I'm in the book of Daniel. I didn't realize how much that would kind of apply to Stearns. You know, Nebuchadnezzar, he was feeling himself, basically. He had a lot of uh, wealth and he kept thinking, oh, it's all about me, you know, it's my intelligence. It's all of me that did this. And then Nebuchadnezzar went through this horrible period of uh, about seven years, I believe, where he basically lost his mind. Ultimately, God brought him back into his right mind. Well, with Stearns, it's reminding me of him just because he does seem a little cocky. He seems like, I don't know, he seems like the kind of guy who probably thought he had it going on. Maybe he thought he was a catch. Maybe that's why him and Jen were off and on. I don't know, maybe he thought highly of himself. And the worst part of it is the way he treated Maddie, obviously, and maybe he never thought he'd get caught. Or maybe there was that torture deep within. I think of that uh, that HBO series, Six Feet Under, from um, years ago, how that title character, he played that role so well, he was just tortured, you know? So I'm wondering, with, with Stearns, the way he was living, the stuff hidden on his phone, I mean, my goodness, that had to just drive him nuts. I mean, I'm so paranoid. I, I'm like, I won't even have anything halfway crazy looking on my phone, I'm just like the hubris of a guy like Stearns keeping such horrible stuff on his phone, likely sharing it, I bet, or just watching it or whatever he did with it, creating it, keeping it horrible, the hubris of him. Maybe he thought he was too smart doing that factory reset, thought he would never get caught. Obviously he did. Again, we wait and we pray. I like at the vigil, the woman who prayed for the prosecutor, Andrew Bain, I thought, wow, yes, pray for that man. Can you imagine what he already knows probably in his mind, what he has to keep secret and what he's saying in interviews and you can't betray 
what you already know. You don't want to mess up the case. You got to have patience and wait to prosecute correctly. Oh my goodness. So stay tuned. Again, I, I'm still digging into this case every day and trying to see what we can learn from the different interviews and along with covering other cases because there seems like there's so many cases going on. Just trying to keep them all straight and just trying to pass along valid information in you know, time where I don't want to waste your time. You know what I mean? I just, I value your time. I thank you all for watching me and I like to edit it down to something, a bite-sized snippet that's informative and let you know what's going on. So thank you for always watching. Take care.